Good morning. Thank you for having me up to this eighth floor. Very happy to be here. It's a bit early. Um, yeah. Um, I was a bit taken aback when Kim contacted me and asked me to speak about robots because it's kind of a far-flung concept for me. I do use a bit of robot, robotic production in my work um, after many, many years of, of kind of resisting. Um, the world we live in now is ensconced with them and it's very difficult to compete uh, in lieu of them, of, of that type of technology. Um, these horns that I produce are, have been constructed by hand, primarily. Um, this is recycled newsprint, and it's bent on a steam mandrel, uh, just like guitar sides. So there's a lot of crossover uh, platform technology taking place. They're arduously glued uh, by hand, using dryer lint, baking soda, and cyano glue. Um, so robot, robotics is the, the last thing that really fig figures into this. But after cutting out the flats over and over again with, with exacto knives, which is a rite of passage, this type of handwork, um, for many of my interns and apprentices, um, I knew it was just a matter of time before a, a digit got lopped off. Um, so we began to have these digitally produced on a knife cutting machine. Um, the tooling up was an arduous process, often expensive, costly mistakes, lots of material blown, shot down the flume. Um, but little by little, we, we corralled it into um, what I might deem as an acceptable digital <laughs> transgression. All of the, the flats for the bases, I have uh, traditionally cut on a table saw with a dado blade and a regular ripping blade. Um, now, uh, after a long chain of events, they're, they're produced on a CNC machine in a nearby production facility. They're still glued up by hand and finished by hand, and there's still a lot of arduous work that goes into them. But these are the two r r uh, aspects in which I've digitized, so to speak. Um, I still abhor digital technology and find it, <laughs> find it very problematic. Um, and I'll try to stay out of the politics of everything as much as I can and just hope this, this thing doesn't cave in on me while I'm trying to. Let's, um, let's see if I can start it. Um, I'll get back to, the, I'd like to address the, con the contrast be between digital and handwork. The vast majority of my work is, is handwork. I was um, thinking about robots and I just made a few notes about the contrast between robotics and handwork. Um, and what we, we're dealing with the contrast between raw mechanics of handwork and microprocessors, obviously the bane of my existence. Sensor technology versus intuition. Um, some things th that sensors cannot uh, understand are the inherent physical properties of, of materials. Um, I rely on getting to know intuitively the tactile properties of materials. Um, if you get up close and personal with various materials, you can, from across the room, begin to intuit how they will respond to various processing medium, drill presses, saws, um, smashing, whatever. Um, things that sensors cannot easily understand in robotics are ductility, malleability, formability, hardenability, and tensile strength. These are things that we should um, be able to predict as cunning humans about the materials we're working with. We gain these, these abilities through experience. Intuition comes from accumulated experience. Robotics is the manifestation of data versus the interpretation of data. Robots do not dream or become inspired. We, we do that. I'd like to just give you a quick overview of some of my work if you're not familiar, this is um, we are. This is an instrument that I made for Alex Capranos from Franz Ferdinand, and he told me that he had a kind of an entomological bent, a passion, and asked me if I could manifest that somehow 
in a guitar. He wanted a meat and potatoes facsimile of a 1972 Telecaster. And um, I obtained 600 beetle wings um, from Bangkok and laid them up like roofing tiles and vacuum infused them with epoxy resin. Um, here we go. Here, this is the thickness of the pickguard. It's about five-eighths of an inch thick. And this neck pocket is a critical attachment to the neck. This is a close-up. Oh, this is backwards. Um, this is an electric mandolin. It's all hand-carved inside and out and assembled like a clamshell. Decorative mother-of-pearl inlay on the headstock of a six-spotted leafhopper. All the, the hardware is machined. These are one-offs. Um, the thing about robotics and automation is that it's geared towards mass production, obviously. And so when you're making one of something over and over again and changing along as you go, it, it, it's a problem because the tooling is the giant expense. So I'm free to create one-off one one singletons. This is an electric lute. Um, there's one on Earth that I know of, this one. Um, and um, it's got a good number of strings. And three of them are bass riders that are supported by this adjustable um, support, uh, the nut on the headstock. There's a tremendous amount of tension on this instrument from the strings. And it, again, has a bolt-on neck with four neck attachment screws attaching it to the body. Um, here's the plate on the back of the headstock or of the body that attaches that neck. Um, I'd like to introduce a concept at this point that is a problem for robots. Um, this is a, a concept called class of fit, and there are three classes of fit in life. And um, controlling these classes of fit is the, is the main way that we are able to produce objects of, of uh, controlled quality. I'm going to... Here we go. Class of fit. These are, um, to, to illustrate this example, I'll use this cross section um, of st guitar strings and a guitar nut. Um, the first class of fit is interference. And an interference fit is when the, the string is a bit larger than the slot. Um, it can be a minor interference, a few angstroms or thousandths of, of an inch, or it can be a colossal interference, um, five or ten thousandths. The second class of fit is exact in the middle, and this exact is exact is exact. Clearance is when we have a bit of slop in the equation, and it can be a minor clearance or a, or a very big clearance. These are critical concepts. It might seem elementary, but um, everything is assembled according to a class of fit. It could be incidental, arbitrary, random, or it can be tightly controlled. When we handcraft things, we have the ability to control the class of fit on the fly. Um, and this is very important. Um, this is a headstock of a guitar, and the bushings that um, go around the tuning posts, uh, the tuning machines, are interference fit into the headstock. They have a little knurling pattern on the, the, the out, outer surface of the cylinder, and this is interference fit down into a strategically um, drilled hole. It's a very specific diameter, and we have about a four thousandth of an inch interference. And I'm taking into account the density of this species of tree, this maple uh, wood that the neck is made out of. Um, if it was mahogany, I would, uh, I would recommend a slightly tighter interference fit. This is important so that we don't crack the lacquer on the surface of the headstock. Um, this is an aluminum guitar body, and here we have our neck pocket exposed and open to view. Um, the neck must fit very exactly, very precisely into the neck pocket. So uh, you saw the lute with all the strings. Um, it can pull, those strings exert a tremendous amount of force laterally on the neck, and so we require a very tight tolerance on the fit of the neck into the pocket. The wood screws that pull the neck into the pocket 
as a means of attachment must be a very strategic interference fit. The teeth of the screws um, bite into the wood of the neck and pull the neck into the pocket. The holes that you see in the guitar where the, that the screws go through must be a very tight or very near clearance fit. So this is all very black and white uh, uh, measure, measuring uh, games. We take a lot of this for granted when we, we go to a, a shelf at a store and we pick a product off the shelf. We just assume that all of this infrastructure has been taken care of for us. But it, it, it doesn't happen by accident. Nothing in the world of fabrication happens by accident. So if we're having robots build everything for us and the adjustments on the computer are off by just a little bit, then everything that rolls off that assembly line that day comes off wrong. And it probably still gets boxed up and goes out to market and they rely on return ratios to find out whether there's a problem or not. It's, um, it's a completely ass backwards way of doing business in, in my opinion. <laughs> um, just to illustrate one of my rationales for building things by hand. I'm lucky because I build things one at a time. My entire product output um, over a 30 year period is only is a little over 600 pieces. So I've got it easy. My heart goes out to uh, large companies that have to build hundreds of thousands of things every day. You know, Too bad for them. Um, I've, I've been building guitar amps uh, for a long time, tube amps. Um, this is uh, one of my original models. This is bent birch uh, wood for the carcass and this is a, um, when did we start, 25? What, what, I'm, I'm trying to keep track of time here, I don't want to run over. Okay, just give me, there's a hook in the corner. Um, this is a schematic, it's a, it's a symbolic representation of an electric, electronic circuit. And this is the, the technology of electronics up through about the 1950s. Um, tube electronics. Uh, this is a layout diagram for that amplifier. And it's pretty simple. You can count the number of parts on one hand. Um, and they're built onto an infrastructure that is very, very strong. This is the motherboard. This is the type of infrastructure that was manifested in the Saturn V rocket that flew to the moon. It used electron tubes as part of the navigation system. And there were special uh, versions of, of tubes that were upgraded in their physical properties so that they could be thrown on the ground and, and not fail. And we think of these as quaint, quaint antiquated technology, but it actually is um, some of the most reliable uh, type of circuitry out there. This is um, back when I was making um, amplifiers. I was pretending to be a company called Specimen, and this was a subsidiary called Petamore, which was a was a, under the umbrella of my fictitious company specimen called, called Petamore, <laughs> which is a colloquialization of the French colloquialization Petite Morte, because it was such a fine amplifier. Um, and I couldn't resist but make this, um, since I'd gone into pr a major production and was making actually 24 of something, um, I couldn't resist making a stereo m version of this. Um, to fly through again. This is a, another one-off. This is a drawing looms very large um, to me in my practice. And um, I actually still, in my, at the Chicago School of Guitar Making, have all of my workbenches convert into drafting tables. And all of the students' eyes get wide and their jaws drop when they come to the design and theory class and discover that they're going to be using pencils and T-squares and triangles and erasers to design a guitar instead of AutoCAD. Um, so thumbnail sketches are the way that I generate ma much of my work and so this was the, the quick vision that I sent to the client for this was Rob Kalin, the, the fellow who started a little company called Etsy and he wanted a guitar amp that had a horn built onto it and he sort of let me take the ball and run with it and um, I gave, her th gave him three echelons of um, involvement and he picked the top level and said, go for it, man. So this is uh, one of my favorite details. And these are subdermal engine-turned convection cooling plates uh, that mount underneath the larger, heavier gauge aluminum 
chassis plate. This is the engine turning, the swirling pattern on the aluminum. And uh, this was inspired by the cowling of the Spirit of St. Louis, the airplane that made the first transatlantic flight flown by Charles Lindbergh. And I saw the, the movie with Jimmy Stewart as a kid where they were, um, some fellow was putting the, the swirling patterns on the cowling. Um, and uh, I searched for years for a, a way to do that, to, to treat a surface of aluminum that way. And I finally discovered the process after much trial and error. There's a product called Kratex rubberized abrasives, and they're available through McMaster Car, and they come in various diameter cylinders, and you can put them in a drill press, and the magic lubricant is kerosene. In, 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 in Europe, it's, it's known as K2 paraffin. And, but you have to be careful because occasionally the, the, the abrasive in the rubberized cylinder will spark a little bit and catch the kerosene on fire. But <laughs> using this as a lubricant, you can, by hand, by moving the metal, bit by bit, creating a, a hand pattern. Um, it's like mowing a lawn and, and getting the, the overlapping lines, sort of. You get these overlapping swirl patterns, and that's the, you know, 1950s diner look, whatever. This is information that fades into the, into the, the distant past. People forget about it, so we're trying to keep these uh, mechanical traditions alive. Back to infrastructure. This is a kind of a 3D chessboard tube amplifier, and um, this is kind of an unprecedented um, exploding of the, the planar infrastructure of an amplifier. And you can see the shot here with the hood up, kind of. These guitar amps uh, morphed into high fidelity playback systems to accompany the horns. Um, this is my single-ended stereo hi-fi unit. And I've worked on this, this footprint, this platform, for, for quite a while. Um, and designed a, a number of different circuits that, that fit into this. This is the schematic. We always need a road map to get where we're going. And this is the symbolic representation of the circuit. And you can see how simple it is. There's really only a handful of discrete components here. It's, it's infinitely serviceable, uh, meant to last many, many generations. And this is the layout diagram of that circuit and its physical um, presence. And this is, uh -oh, this is the actual physical manifestation of that on, under the, underneath. So when we come to regard ecological concerns, disposability, longevity, um, something that's manifested in an infra with un infrastructural fortitude like this can be handed down for many, many uh, generations as opposed to being s thrown away or recycled in some so-called green um, way. Um, something to take into consideration. I f find it's far more ecological to have something last forever. Um, this is a line preamp, and this is under, under the hood there. I find great beauty in the, these arrangements. This is another exercise in ex excess. It's the octoblock amplifier. It's an eight-channel, single-ended amp. Front view, rear view, and the Odyssey within. Um, panoramic vista of, of modular repetition. It's far more simple than it looks. The Janus horn, spinning horn, that I originally produced for Andrew Bird, he was the target of my whimsy. And th this is, again, the recycled newsprint uh, bent and assembled into a one-off form. And this is the end product. Um, this horn uh, rotates above a speaker in the bass and produces a phase-shifting stereo chorus, acoustic chorus. Uh, no microprocessors involved. It's, it's purely mechanical. And so it allows the expanding wavefronts of sound to um, phase in and out with one another as the pitch shifts, sort of like a train going <laughs> by and creating the Doppler effect. Um, visually, you can intuit the physical phenomenon taking place. Even if you know nothing about sound waves, you can look at this thing rotating and kind of intuitively understand how it works. Um, so Jack White calls up one day and he says, I want one of your spinning horns, but I want you to hang it from my ceiling upside down. <laughs> uh, 
And I said, okay, it's going to take a bit of engineering. And he said, well, why don't you just think on that a little while? And so this thumbnail got approved, and this is, it wound up getting manifested surprisingly um, close to the original idea. But this really was a, a challenge in that I'm now hanging something heavy and spinning over somebody's head. Um, <laughs> this is the inside of the, the chamber. We have a compression chamber for the speaker. Um, talk about improvised engineering. There's, uh, I'd be very curious to try to take this into production, you know. Um, these are the, uh, the parts that were machined um, in my shop out of steel instead of aluminum since it, um, it's going to be above somebody's head. Um, I'm using uh, compression collets, uh, compression bushings to grab hold of this shaft. And I, they're rated for 800 pounds each, so I use two of them just to try to cover my, my bases. This is uh, the first object, the first tool that I purchased upon moving to Chicago in 1986 was this lathe. I bought it at Halsted and Lake Street at Aaron's Used Machinery. I don't think it's there anymore. Um, I spent half of my student loan on this machine. I still use it um, all the time. Um, I was speaking about tactile interface, and I believe that this is a critical disconnect between our modern youngsters learning how to use computers to engineer and design things and learning uh, the mechanical hand t techniques um, that I find critical to design. Um, this is a motorized tool but if you'll notice the cranks that are on the apron of the, uh, of the tool, um, one is a X, one's a Y, one's a cross feed, and um, as the, the, the spindle, to the chuck, rotates the material, and we turn the apron cranks and, and move the tool into the material, you can feel the cutting edge bite into the metal. It's, it's, it's very distinct. Um, and you can feel when you're, going too, when you're taking too big a bite, just like chewing food, you know? You know when you're about to blow it and choke, right? Um, <laughs> or if something's gotten into your mouth full of food. Um, you can tell if there's, if there's contamination in the billet of stock that you're machining. It's down to that. A robot can't tell that. A robot can't feel anything. It can only do what its sensors are telling it that's going on, right? So this tactile interface becomes critical to developing an intuition for how to design. How do I choose this alloy aluminum over this alloy aluminum? Well, I know because I tried cutting this piece of stuff last week, and now I know. It's you know, like riding a bike, you never forget. Other things you never forget. You don't forget these things. When you, if you almost kill yourself trying to do something it, it's a, by working a material. Um, it's very important. You can look at consumer products on the shelf and you can see plain as day how it was designed by some kid who'd never picked up a hammer or a pair of pliers and was simply given a list of, of um, attributes of the materials and it went to market. Um, took a mold of it and cast eight of these sections and uh, glued them together. Um, this is uh, fi fiberglass and resin and it became, became a kind of a decorative top and also covering a lot of the machinery for that piece. After I delivered this to Jack, he, uh, he's great because he gets carried away. And he, he asked for um, horns to go all around his offices at Third Man Records. Um, and I coined the term g gimbal horn. And uh, this was just a, a quick vision of something to throw on the, the plate for him. Um, he wanted to have a PA system that, so he could call out to his minions to, to, <laughs> to bring things around and serve as the uh, background music as well. So these three thumbnails wound up turning into um, the Gimbalhorn project proper. And so they, we have two different sizes. This is the large Tractrix curve, and this is the smaller, more polite version. Um, the gimbal yoke, which is at the top, it's cast aluminum. And I first carved that out of wood. Um, and, here, and then cleaved it in two, and there's half on this side and half on the other side. This is called a cope and drag, and this is a, a, a hand mechanical alternative to um, injection molding or, or die casting that happens on a large robotic production scale. I made one uh, plug mold out of wood, out of basswood, hand carved, 
And then um, we pack sand on both sides of the, the Copen drag, you can see both sides, it's packed sand. And here we're pouring molten aluminum into it. And the end result, out comes the part, which is then finished, um, sanded and smoothed and machined to become this uh, part. There's a hardened steel pin that fits with a very, very close clearance fit into a hardened steel bushing, which is interference fit into the casting, <laughs> okay? Press fit with about four thousandths interference, so it's never, never going to go anywhere again once it's been pressed in with an arbor press. And this, this genius little nipple here, when you press on it, these two ball bearing detents collapse into the shaft and you're able to pull it out. This is a registration comb so that we can tilt the horn and it can gimbal this way or this way and we can point it wherever we want to get our message across. A lot of lovely work for a, um, an entertaining end. This is how the cylinder of the gimbal horn and the ceiling Janus horn were made. A lousy MDF material cut into a mold and uh, thin sheets of birch wrapped up into a cylinder and smeared with glue and then I inflated a kickball inside of it to clamp it to the outer surface of the, the mold. And this is the way the Ludwig Drum Company used to make drum shells back in the day, right here in Chicago. Um, the accounting department wondered why I was ordering a dozen kickballs. <laughs> and um, how are we doing on time? Okay, because this could go on far too long. Um, the audio horns here, um, my first patent was issued for this um, device, which is um, just an audio playback horn. It's part bandpass filter, part reflex chamber. Um, but what these horns do that's very different um, than typical modern playback systems is they create a spatial sound stage that's very, very different um, from typical systems. They also look very different than a black rectangular box. Um, part of the, the mids and the lows come out of the horn up top, and the mids and highs come out of the, the single driver at the bottom. The whole thing is kind of inverted uh, to what we're used to. Um, drafted uh, cross-sections of, of drawings. Now, these are octagonally fluted shapes, and even made out of the recycled newsprint material, um, and I've gone beyond that into other materials now, but the octagonal flutes create a structurally profound geometry. It's much, much stronger than um, what you would think of as a cardboard construction, um, which is then impregnated with um, shellac, which is um, beetle excrement. Um, but the center line of this drawing um, is, is just a gesture, and then the two outer uh, perimeter lines are equidistant to the center line. And if we were are going to segment these into uh, sections that are equal and call them all octagons, the shape automatically establishes itself. I really just made one line gesture relative to a center line. Um, these are eight foot tall versions of this. It can be scaled up and down. The guitar is in there for scale. And here is the drawing for this horn that's right here. A single gestural line imposed or imbued with a geometric concept and the shape happens automatically. Here's an assortment of different um, size horns which I've now gone on to use in the Sonic Arboretum exhibitions using these as pixel sources for sound, um, and at, at the MCA we had 72 sound sources um, for brand new possibilities of compositional playback. Whimsical renderings, three-dimensional shapes, bulkhead, avionic style constructions. Um, these are skeletal maquettes that I initially used instead of software, um, computer software, to, to generate the flats to construct these shapes. Um, the, little, the original little horn and a couple of other shapes. And um, this is how we get them from point A to point B on these uh, kind of circus crates. Um, and now, uh, the future project that I'm working on now is called the aerosol. And when I was at the Guggenheim 
exhibiting the first Sonic Arboretum. I went to Coney Island for the first time and was amazed by the ancient rusting hulks of rides off in the distance. And um, this kind of sprung to mind. And this is a large construction. Here it is installed in Central Park. And the whole crown rotates. These horns are 15 or 20 feet tall. And they're octagonally fluted and helically coiled tractrix curves. And so they're aerodynamic in addition to being sonic. And as the whole crown rotates and these horns come and go like children on a merry-go-round, they rotate as they come and go and create the Doppler effect and also shift in proximity. Um, so essentially it's an eight-channel playback system. It's a compositional tool for some lucky composer. Um, and I don't know what it's going to sound like. No one does. <laughs> These shapes are generated, again, back to the single line gesture creating a rather exotic geometry. Here we have an assortment of gestures relative to a straight line. And so I divide these into equal increments. Computer people do this all day long. For me, this is a revelation on paper with pencil and an eraser. Um, to take these increments and impose them on the helically um, coiled shape. So here comes the skeletal maquette of this shape. Um, I machined all of the, the vertebra for the ribs. Um, and so the, the shapes slowly took form. And I just completely got carried away and made um, six different shapes. Um, and the, the eighth inch various diameter dowel rods, um, steam bent, spliced together, and then covered with silk. Here's the covering process, just like old airplanes. And then here they are. Um, they got co-opted by Andrew Bird and went on tour. They got beaten up rather quite a bit by the roadies. But um, they survived. Um, and was, they were used as visual uh, stage ornaments and had lights shone through them so that they, they uh, projected large undulating shadows. Um, and they've been around. And here's the whole menagerie on stage. Um, I'll just fly very quickly through. These are various iterations of the Sonic Arboretum. The MCA can beat me to, on the draw with this image. This is the Guggenheim as a one-off show with Andrew. This is where we debuted everything. And um, that was the tip of the iceberg right there. Was, that's just a good shot. And then we just got this show back from the ICA in Boston. And this show was unique. It was a, Groundbreaking in that in lieu of the $5,000 48-channel digital playback uh, recorder that we used before at the MCA, this time, um, this is, these are the two views, so this is the whole gallery from either end looking. There's two eight-foot horns, two different size spinning horns, and um, three rafts of, of uh, static horns. They were all powered by this device called the NanoSync. My daughter calls it the Nano Commando. <laughs> but it takes 10 iPod Nanos, and with this comb, it's sort of like a waffle iron. The, this machined aluminum comb folds over and touches. It's got capacitive, moistened cap capacitive sponge bits in each of its 10 fingers, and they come down and touch the touch screen and simultaneously start all 10 Nanos, which are flash drive digital playback. And so we have 20 channels of audio that stay in sync once they're all started together. I thought that I would be able to say, all right, group, one, two, three, play. <laughs> but it doesn't work because the, we all are slightly, have different capacitances and reflexes and the whole thing. So it didn't work very well. But the, the nano sync solved the problem. And we were able to keep this, the show running. They would sync it periodically, I think just because they like to do it. Um, but. Um, this is what ran the, the whole show. And the, the benefit is that uh, we don't have fickle, fading, dropout wireless technology. We also don't have wires running all over the place. We've got eight or 10 standalone nanos powering all these different channels. So I really enjoyed the fact that we were mixing cutting edge modern digital with 1940s era electronics and the solid, indefatigable infrastructure. It was kind of an interface of the two polar opposites manifested in the same place. It just so happened that the bright colors of my um, 
motif of, of my audio line happen to coalesce with the, the bright colors of all the different nanos. So it's kind of a, a nice match. And uh, we've actually made it through a lot of slides in half an hour. So <laughs> thank you very much.